Norman Finkelstein is the latest pro-Palestinian voice to go on the Piers Morgan show. Um, Finkelstein is a world-renowned scholar and author of Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom. Piers started um, by asking his favourite two questions to Finkelstein. I've asked a lot of guests this, these two questions, and I'll be curious about your answer. One, would you categorise it as a terror attack? And secondly, would you condemn Hamas for what they did? My view is as follows. Number one, as far as the evidence shows now, atrocities occurred on October 7th. The magnitude of the atrocities and the types of atrocities, for example, were children beheaded, were women raped. That remains, so far as I can tell from the evidence, an open question. However, that there were atrocities that occurred, my answer is yes. Number two, that's a, that's a factual question. Then there's well, the question a legal was, was question. it a terror attack? Yeah. Well, atrocities, it seems to me, denotes a terror attack. Okay. Thank that's you. That's what atrocities okay. are. Thank you. Okay. So number two, that's the factual question. And then there is the legal question. As a matter of law, it seems unquestionable that the people who perpetrated these atrocities would be prosecuted and convicted in a court of law. However, I would say on the legal question, I should think that there would be some mercy shown because those who carried out the atrocities were concentration camp inmates. Number three, which I think is the one that concerns you the most, is the moral question. And at a moral level, my view is, my basic precept, we may disagree, my basic precept is that there but for the grace of God go I. That is to say, I'm very reluctant to condemn people who are in a position or in a condition such that were I in that position or condition, I'm not sure what I would do. Now, the 1,500 young men who burst the gates of Gaza, they were born into a concentration camp. They lived for two decades in a concentration camp. They had no past. They had no present. They had no future. They had no jobs. Half of them, according to humanitarian organizations, suffered from what's called severe food insecurity. And then on top of that, as I'm sure you know, Pierce, because you keep up with the news, periodically Israel goes into Gaza and it mows the lawn. And you know what mows the lawn means. It means a high-tech massacre in Gaza. Now, really impressive answer, I think, because it was so precise. You know, he's very precise with his words. And, you know, I assume Norman Finkelstein has the confidence to do that because he has chronicled what has happened in, in Gaza in great detail, right? He clearly knows so much more about the reality in Gaza than Piers Morgan does. Um, I said Piers Morgan started with that question. In fact, there was about four minutes before that where they were discussing um, a, a post Norman Finkelstein had done on Substack after October the 7th, where he had sort of initially been celebrating um, the, the attack because he had seen you know, the footage of, of the fence being taken down and it looking more like a, an act of, um, you know, armed resistance, but without targeting civilians. Norman Finkelstein ended up saying, you know, he, he, he feels much more complicated about it. He wouldn't celebrate it now because he's seen how many civilians were killed. But I think that answer was just very impressive because, you know, he's not celebrating the actions. And I do think it's very, very difficult to sort of look at some of the things that happened on October the 7th and the innocent people who, who were killed and sort of say, oh, that's a great thing. We celebrate that. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I think it's very problematic to do that. And he sort of said he started doing that until he saw the reality of it and took it back. But he's not willing to condemn the people um, because, you know, who knows what one would do if you'd lived in a concentration camp for 20 years, right? If, if your whole life had been spent in a concentration camp, who are we to condemn the people so without sort of saying you, you endorse the action, and I actually think it's possible to basically condemn the action, but not the people. You know, th that seems to me intellectually coherent. 
asked. Um, but in any case, I think he, 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 he held himself very, very well there. Um, let's go back to the interview because Piers Morgan has another go at getting Norman Finkelstein to condemn Hamas. If you can't start from a basic humanity position of saying what happened on October the 7th was a, a disgusting terror attack worthy of condemnation, then for me, I find it very hard to then respect anyone's demand for people to condemn Israel and their response. Piers, I'm really, and I'm trying to be candid with you. Number one, I appreciate your humanity. I do. I don't know you from Adam. I'm not a TV or a television or a social media kind of person. I'm a book person. I'm old fashioned. However, I do recall that when that famous moment when Susan Boyle appeared on Britain's Got Talent, and I remember the camera turning to you, focusing on you, I could see it in my mind's eye. I saw your eyes narrow, and suddenly the humanity in you came up. Here is this obscure woman whose talent had gone unrecognized. And if I can speak to that same program, for me, the most poignant moment, the one I carry with me my entire, since that moment, was when Simon Cowell asked um, Susan Boyle, well, why haven't you been discovered yet? And she replied, because I haven't been given a chance. And that's how I feel about the people of Gaza. My respect for Norman Finkelstein, I mean, couldn't be higher after watching that clip, you know, <laughs> he said, especially the way he does it. I'm not a TV guy, you know, I'm a book guy. And then goes into great detail about a scene with Susan Boyle and Piers Morgan and Simon Cow, as if this is the language that Piers Morgan will understand. Piers Morgan completely blown away. He does not know what is happening. But the point was a serious one and it was very, very well made, sorry. Um, and as I say, you know, it is a serious point. Um, and he goes on to make it um, with with reference to the reality of what's going on in Gaza. So let's go back to that clip to see what Norman Finkelstein says next. That's how I feel about those young men in Gaza. You ask me why I won't condemn them. Because those young men were born into a concentration camp. They were born into among the most dense population uh, populated places on, on God's earth. Half of the population of Gaza's children, 70% are refugees who were expelled from Israel in 1948 and their descendants. 70% of those of Gaza's youth have no jobs, no future, no nothing. They are Susan Boyle times 10,000, never given a chance. And as things looked the night before October 7th, when the question of Gaza was disappearing from the public stage, I will admit to you, Piers, I myself had given up on Gaza. In 2020, I decided it's hopeless. It's pointless. I only have a finite number of years left in my life, and it's time for me to move on. And I'll tell you, that was a wrenching decision on my part, because I knew I was abandoning the people who for 15 years I had devoted my life to chronicling every detail of the horror that had been inflicted on those people. And I gave up on them. Okay. And that meant if I gave up, they had no future because I was the last chronicler. Okay, but what I would say- Gaza. All right. Now, I, I mean, I thought that was very emotional because, you know, Norman Finkelstein, has devoted, you know, he, he's not lying there. He has devoted many, many years to chronicling what has gone on in Gaza. And I believe him, actually, when he says that he, he'd sort of stopped thinking about it because I do think everyone had sort of expected, you know, the Gazan struggle to just, or the Palestinian struggle in Gaza to just sort of slowly disappear and die. I mean, the wager that the Israelis were making is that they can provide no justice for the Palestinians, but they're 
security system is 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 so well established that they can completely ignore them you know and and because it was sort of a a slow death of of, of the Gazan struggle the world was sort of willing to to ignore it now it's 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 very unclear to me if the actions of Hamas has has turned that around, right? Obviously, people are now paying attention to Gaza, but also it, it gave an excuse for for the Israelis to to counterattack and and kill, you know, over thirteen thousand people, potentially much much higher than that. Um, and I, I don't necessarily see how that attack is going to lead to justice for the Gazans. But what he is explaining there is is I think the incredibly important context here, which is the reason so many Gazans were willing to take this risk is because, you know, what was the alternative? The alternative was so unattractive that taking a risk to say, here we are, world, you know, Israel might counterattack with that. Now, obviously, you know, if I was in the control room designing this action, right, I, I think probably you could have had the, the benefit of people taking notice without Israel being able to sort of whitewash its complete, you know, attempted genocide in, in Gaza if you had only gone for military targets instead of innocent civilians, right? But you know th th these things are very complex and difficult, and you can see why a people with no hope do take this kind of rash action. Now, I've often heard sort of people in or supporters of Israel say this Hamas attack proves why you can't make peace with the Palestinians and why they can't have a state of their own. For example, I think in a way it proves the opposite because if you had a state of your own, you know, states don't normally do this to other states because they don't want to get invaded right if if you if you give your neighbor a pretext if you give your more powerful neighbor like your your neighbor that has military supremacy to the nth degree right if you do a provo provocative attack towards them you won't do that because you don't want to get invaded you don't want your state to be destroyed but hamas and gaza they think we don't have anything to be destroyed right so how can you expect actors to sort of you know, behave like a rational state if you haven't given them a state. They are acting out of desperation. You know, and you can say, well, the, the consequences have been terrible. Also, civilians were killed in horrific circumstances. This isn't to say the action was, was, was right. But desperate actions are taken by people in desperate situations. And you can't really describe a more desperate situation than what's going on in Gaza right now. And I think Norman Finkelstein put that very well. And we got one last clip um, we'll, we'll show you. Now, Norman Finkelstein here is asked um, about his parents, um, how his parents would have responded to the Hamas attacks. Now, famously, Finkelstein's parents were both concentration camp survivors during the Nazi Holocaust. How would my parents have reacted? My guess is if on the first day they heard that inmates in a concentration camp burst its gates, I think my parents would be very pleased at that fact. As the events became clearer, my guess, but this is pure speculation, my guess is my parents would go out with their hearts, would go out to those who burst the gates of the concentration camp and whose lives were destroyed. Now, you will say to me, completely legitimately, you would say, well, what would your parents feel about the innocents who were slaughtered in the atrocities on that date? So I'm going to give you as close an answer as I could give, I, as I'm able to. I once asked my late mother, I said to her, what was your feeling when you heard that the German cities were being terror bombed during World War II? The carpet bombing of the German cities targeting civilians. What was your feeling? And my mother's response to me was, quote, our feeling was if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. Now, that's not the most morally elevated statement. I agree. And do I wish my mother had and my father had a heightened sensitivity to German civilian life? I suppose I would wish it. But I will tell you, Piers, to the last day of my parents' life, 
it was unthinkable that they would have a kind word to say about Germans. And it was unthinkable that I would ever quarrel with them on that point. Okay. I accepted, I accepted that given their life experience, they okay. had the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Okay. And the people Professor of Gaza have the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Now, again, I just thought that was so powerful and, and so precise as well, right? Because he, he's not saying, you know, it, it was the right thing for his parents to hate the Germans, but they have the right to do it. it it's not for him to tell them, not to hate the Germans. Now, obviously, I, I think in this time, lots of people have sort of been thinking about the South African struggle because of the obvious you know, parallels of apartheid, people sort of comparing Hamas to the ANC, et cetera. Now, what was very interesting with, with, with Nelson Mandela, especially later in his life, he uh, you know, made a big deal out of sort of telling black South Africans, you know, I can see why you want to respond with violence. I can see why you want to take revenge on white South Africans. But that's not how we get to where we want to be. You know, that's not strategically wise. And you have to rise above it. And I think that's incredibly impressive, right? And, uh, and, uh, and I do think that sort of treating people with the hatred they treated you is not necessarily always the right thing to do. You know, I think it often is strategic to take the higher ground. And obviously, you know, hatred is not a good thing. If you can avoid hatred, that's great. But who are we to judge people who respond to their own oppression by hating their oppressors? You know, it's, it's, it's not an endorsement of the hatred of those oppressors, but who are we to judge people who do respond in that manner? Ash, what did you make of that, that, that interview in general? I thought that what Norman Finkelstein was doing was something really important. And he was articulating an empathetic connection. Now, normally when we talk about empathy, what we mean is sympathy a feeling of, oh, my heart goes out to you. But that's not really what empathy is. The kind of empathy that Norman Finkelstein was embodying was this sense of going, let me imagine what it is like to be somebody else. And let me take you, Piers Morgan, the viewer, on that journey of what this person's experience must be like. He did that by talking about the experience of young men who grew up to be Hamas fighters, who were born, who were raised in an open air prison in the world's largest concentration camp, whose whole lives have been defined by a blockade, by siege, by bombardment, by scarcity and by lack of opportunity. And then in the latter portion of the interview, he does something which I think is incredibly brave, which is he breaks down the distinction between Jewish experiences of suffering in the Holocaust and Palestinian and in particular Gazan experiences of suffering in the present. Because usually when the history of the Holocaust gets invoked with regards to Palestine, it only goes one way. And it's framing the need for Israel to be a Jewish majority state which doesn't allow for the existence of an independent sovereign Palestinian state because of the need to protect Jewish lives. Why do we have that pressing need? Well, it's because of the near extermination of the Jewish population in the 1930s and the 1940s. What Norman Finkelstein instead is doing is he's saying, well, hang on, there are parallels here between experiences of extreme suffering and what that extreme suffering does to you in terms of how it makes you look at the people who are your oppressor, in this case, Israelis, being brutalized, being oppressed, being denied your rights, being starved, being bombed, being arrested. These aren't things that turn people generally into well-adjusted, happy, open, tolerant members of society. There's a reason why saints don't really walk the earth anymore. And it's because torment generally doesn't actually make you a better person. When you're put into a mode of fight or flight, when your survival response is activated constantly, when you're in a constant state 
of what psychologists call high arousal, which isn't to do with eroticism, it's to do with being alert, your body being flooded with adrenaline and with cortisol. You 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 end up with a way of forming judgments, which aren't the way that we would want everyone to form judgments, but these are adaptive mechanisms which are formed in response to utterly horrific conditions. And so the same way that you wouldn't judge somebody who had been locked up in one of Assad's prisons in Syria, who'd been tortured, you wouldn't judge them for coming out and not not making judgments in the way that you would feel is most socially useful. Norman Finkelstein saying you, you, you can't hold people in Gaza to the same moral standards as you would for people who haven't experienced bombardment, who haven't experienced siege, who haven't experienced blockade, because it is an inherently warping thing to happen. And to do that by invoking his parents' own experiences of concentration camps, I think is a very brave and a very moving thing to do. It is truly empathetic. It is truly imagining the self in the other and having that mirror back again and again and again through that interview. Mm, and I, I mean, I do think that's so important because, um, you know, anyone who follows me on Twitter would have seen that last night I went to see that 45 minute long um, sort of film made by the IDF out of footage from, in some circumstances, Hamas. Um, body cameras in some circumstances, dash cam footage in some circumstances, um, uh, footage from first responders. And it is, you know, it's it's very distressing. You know, th there are scenes where you can see fighters target and kill civilians, a clear war crime. Now, I should say, I, I think the moments where you actually see that is in single digits. You see lots and lots of dead people, right? But it, it's difficult to piece together exactly the sequence of events. And I think it's very irresponsible the way um, that the IDF is sort of putting together this screening, not giving any of the, um, uh, the, the, the footage to journalistic outlets that can actually verify it and put it into proper context and report it independently. And basically showing it to a load of journalists who can then sort of go on their to commentators, essentially, who can then go on their radio stations and sort of say the things I saw are unimaginable. And then the audience can let their imaginations go wild, right? Many of the things you have heard about, you know, beheaded babies, um, you know, people burnt alive intentionally. You know, there are lots of charred bodies. You, you, you don't know how it happened, right? Who, who was it who exploded that car? None of this context is there. And this is not to deny that there were atrocities. There were clear atrocities. Some of them are in that film. But the fact that they are showing this in secret and then getting people to sort of performatively say, you won't believe the things I've seen, I think it's ideologically very, very problematic. But the reason I bring this up here is because one of the things that people seem most shocked about when they watch the movie, right? Oh, it's not a movie, is it? The, the, the footage, the, the curated film, let's say, because it is heavily curated by the IDF, is they are shocked that some of the, the militants, fighters, terrorists, whatever you want to call them, do seem to be celebrating the killing of Israelis. And they do speak, you know, of people as dogs, right? And people seem to be interpreting that as that there is this ancient hatred. These are people who are deeply um, anti-Semitic in the same way that the Nazis were anti-Semitic. These are people who are amid this sort of incredibly violent culture full of bloodlust. And kind of, I watched it, and it's difficult to watch. You know, as I say, I don't think anyone should kill civilians, right? I, I don't think that's a good thing. It's a bad thing. But I didn't watch that and think, oh my God, where did these guys get all this hatred from, right? To me, that seemed like, oh, I can see why they have all this hatred. Not to justify it. This is not to justify it, but to explain it is because these people's lives have been ruined by Israel, right? They've never met an Israeli, apart from maybe having a gun pointed at them. And so they are filled with hatred of Israelis. And yes, I mean, if it, to move towards some sort of sustainable peace, maybe you will need a kind of Nelson Mandela figure who, who helps people sort of put those hatreds behind them. But it's not surprising, right? It, it's not surprising. You don't need to sort of say, oh, they're, they're, this is uh, Islamist ISIS-like, uh, an Islamist ISIS-like ideology of hatred. No, it's, 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 it's how a colonized people often respond to their colonizer. Again, it's not to justify it, it's to explain it. It's not surprising.
But I think you have so many people who don't have the kind of knowledge that Norman Finkelstein has, the, the empathy, as you say, and that Norman Finkelstein has, who, who say, well, how can they celebrate killing people? They must be pure evil. 